in 2012. It voted for Hillary Clinton by one point in 2016, and it voted for Lizzie Fletcher, the new Democratic Congresswoman from the west side of Houston, by four points in 2018. This move means that not only did Democrats mobilize their own constituency, not only did progressives and Democratic women and uh, liberals of all stripes come out of the woodworks to vote, but they owed their success moving from a small victory in the House to a landslide victory in the House because of millions of people who are traditionally Republicans. The New York Times has a very interesting story about this today, which I'd commend to all of you who are interested in this trend, because what this means is that the Democratic majority, moving from a plurality of 48% who voted for Hillary Clinton to a 53% House majority as the vote stands today, that difference between 48 and 53% is not because suddenly six million new progressives came out of the woodwork. It's because five or six million people who have voted Republican most of their lives joined the Democratic coalition. What that does to a Democratic coalition is how they can manage it is something I'll cover at the end of my talk. But the reason the Democrats have 235 House seats is overwhelmingly on the back of what conservative Republicans have derided for years as rhinos. If you uh, are of a conservative persuasion, you've heard conservatives talk about how all these moderates are destroying the party's chance to be a true conservative party, and all we have to do is hunt the rhinos and get them out of our party. Uh, well, the hunter, rhinos were not hunted to extinction, but they were hunted to a point where they chose a new habitat. And what that meant was that the conservative Republican Party that people had longed for on the hard right of the Republican Party, uh, in fact, is not a majority. And I think a Republican who has any sense about them will now have to look and say, hmm, maybe those rhinos weren't so bad to begin with. But these trends extended all the way down throughout the ballot that not only did these people vote for Democrats for Congress, that if you look deeper, you will see that they voted for Democrats in virtually every race on the ballot. And case in point is Arizona, where Kristen Sinema became the first uh, Democrat elected to the Senate in over 20 years, and did so by being the first Democrat in over 20 years in a contested gubernatorial, presidential, or senatorial race to carry Maricopa County, home to Phoenix, cast 60% of the state's votes. That's how much it's dependent on one metropolitan area. Who switched? <clears throat> College-educated voters. In, Mitt, in 2012, Mitt Romney won over 60% of them. Uh, in 2018, Kirsten Sinema won them 51 to 47. And if you go down and look where they live, you find that Republicans don't represent these areas in that Arizona State House anymore. They got kicked out three weeks ago. Don't represent them in the Senate anymore if they were on the ballot. They got kicked out. They didn't vote for the Republican for Secretary of State. They didn't vote Republican for the Superintendent of Public Instruction. They voted Democratic up and down the ballot. And you'll see this in similar places across the country. You'll see this in suburban Chicago, where two wealthy Romney uh, voting districts uh, elected Democratic congressmen and kicked out Republicans. You will see this in Atlanta, where a district that voted for Romney by 23 points and Trump by one elected a, a, a Democratic woman by two points. And Republicans up and down the State House were losing their seats in territory that overlook, overlaps that. This was a partisan move to show revulsion against a Republican Party that they no longer feel home in. Uh, but this did not show up and affect the Senate results. Why? Because there's another trend that had less effect on the outcome, but will show up more in 2020 uh, because of the nature of where they live. And that is that the blue-collar former Democrat or former independent, the person who voted for Obama twice and voted for Gore and voted for Kerry, and if they're old enough, voted for Clinton twice, uh, that person in the Midwest and other similar places came over to vote for Trump in 2016. And by and large, that person stayed with the Republican Party if there was a contested race. These people, whom I think that uh, they deserve a nickname too, so I call them tigers. Uh, Trump is great Republicans. Uh, because they're Republicans because they think Trump is great. Uh, and, but they transferred their loyalty down ballot this time. They are the reason why Mike DeWine, despite being behind in polls throughout most of the campaign, is the new governor-elect of Ohio. They are the reason why Kim Reynolds, despite being behind in polls in the last month of the campaign, is the new governor-elect 
of, uh, of Iowa. They are the reason why two contested races in suburban seats in Cincinnati and Columbus did not switch to the Democrats. They stayed Republican uh, because Tigers voted for Steve Shabbat in Ohio 1 and Troy Balderson in Ohio 12. And when you look at the Senate races, they are the reason why Republicans picked up Senate seats in Indiana, Missouri, and North Dakota. Let's take a look at these states. Let's take a look at Missouri, because this is where the trend is most obvious. That Claire McCaskill won 54% of the vote when she was running against a very weak Republican challenger, uh, or challenger Todd Aiken in 2012. Uh, if you compare her share of the vote in 2018 to that, her share of the vote in St. Louis and its suburbs, in Kansas City and its suburbs, and in the central county of Boone, which contains Columbia, the home to the University of Missouri, you would find that she did not lose enough votes in these areas to lose. She would project to, if she had done that well outside of the metropolitan area, she would have cruised to a comfortable 51 or 52 percent of the vote. The reason she lost by six, and, and these areas cast 43 percent of the votes on election day. So she basically wins 43 percent of the state. She loses by six points statewide. Why? Because she gets annihilated in the rural areas. She gets annihilated anywhere outside of a metropolitan or micropolitan area. The same is true in Indiana. You take a look at uh, Joe Donnelly. He also had a weak opponent in 2012, uh, a man named Richard Murdoch. Uh, and so Donnelly got 50 percent in traditionally Republican Indiana. You compare his margin in Indianapolis, he did well enough to win. You look at his margin in the most upper income city in the state. Uh, or county in the state. Uh, it's a Republican county, so he lost it. But he did much better among wealthy Republicans in Hamilton County than he had done when he won the state uh, uh, six years before. He did much better in Monroe County, uh, a college town. Now, together, these places and similar places like it cast a quarter or 30 percent of the vote. Why does he lose by six points? He gets wiped out in rural areas, and the urban decaying old steel towns that stretch along the way, place where Indiana joins Lake Michigan, from Gary over to South Bend, he won them by half the margin that he did six years ago. The area that moved to Trump stuck with Mike Braun, the Republican nominee, even though Trump wasn't on the ballot. The reason John Tester survives in Montana, he too lost all the rural areas that uh, his margins went down. But Montana is a more urban state. There are fewer people on the ranch lands and more people uh, who are around Montana State University or the University of Montana in Missoula or some of the resort areas around Big Sky. His margins improved in the five counties that cast about 40% uh, of the vote. And uh, that consequently meant that he could withstand the same sort of swing that cost Donnelly and Heitkamp and McCaskill her seats because, uh, simply because of the different demographics of the state. What this means is that the 2016 Republican coalition largely held together. That the people who voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016 voted for Hillary Clinton. The people who didn't vote for either major party candidate tended to vote Democratic, even though they were not normally Democrats. But if you voted for Donald Trump in 2016, despite everything that has happened, despite all of the controversy, you stuck with him, even if, and you stuck with his party, even, with, even if you were not traditionally a Republican. So that gives Republicans actually a glimmer of hope going into 2020, that while their coalition is also difficult to manage, as I'll explain in a couple of minutes, they have an opportunity to repeat what they did in 2016, win a majority of the Electoral College and win a majority in the Senate while losing the national popular vote. It's not a pretty outcome, but that's the way our country is governed. The third group that has gotten virtually no attention, but that is worth mentioning, is Latinos. That if one thing we have heard over the last three years, it is Trump campaigning about immigration and campaigning in a way that has elicited uh, a lot of coverage that uh, either calls or strongly suggests that he is racist and nativist. So one would expect that perhaps the group that is targeted or allegedly targeted by these ads would swing against the president in massive numbers. Did not happen. That the Republican, uh, mar the Democratic margin among Latinos was nearly unchanged between 2016 and 2018. The Democratic margin among African Americans has always been huge. That did not change, but it also did not get better. Uh, it was 81 points in 2016. It was 81 points in the general election in 2018. 
all of the improvement in the, Afri in, in the Democratic vote uh, as far as vote shift comes from whites with a college degree. And the reason why Rick Scott is a senator and the reason why Ron DeSantis is governor in Florida is because they significantly outperformed uh, Charles and Trump among Latinos, particularly Cubans. If you look throughout the country at an area where Republican voters who had voted for Romney moved towards President Clinton, you will almost always find law, strong Democratic gains at the state legislative level, not in Cuban Miami. Cubans, instead, Cubans who voted in 2016 for Hillary Clinton came back to the Republican Party in 2018. That's why Carlos Curbelo nearly won a district that Mrs. Clinton carried by well over 10 points, and why Maria Salazar almost succeeded in a Miami area district that Mrs. Clinton won by over 20 points. And it's why nobody who was a Cuban representative in an area that Hillary Clinton had carried lost their reelection in Miami. It's because the Cubans came home. Puerto Ricans did as well. Rick Scott outperformed uh, Donald Trump, particularly in the heavy Puerto Rican communities in and around Orlando. When you win by 10,000 votes and you're running six to 10 points around a, a very strong ethnic minority, uh, you can count that that's why you won. The Republic Democrats did not also get a strong uh, moderate Republican effect. Florida, this is one of two or three states where you can look at suburbs and see there's no desertion of the president. There's no desertion of the party in upper income areas on the west side of Florida that border the Gulf of Mexico. There's little to no desertion in the high income areas south of Jacksonville. They stuck with the Republican Party, much as people of similar means uh, in Cincinnati stuck with the Republican Party. That's something Democrats ought to take a look at because it's very difficult for a Democrat to win without winning Florida unless they recreate the entire blue wall which means they have to talk to a group that has now rejected them largely in two consecutive elections. So what this means going forward, however, is that we have now become more stratified by where we live. That we now have, as I said, Democrats representing almost all of the educated and wealthy areas in the country. Uh, they also represent almost all of the poor and ethnic minority areas of the country. Yet the Republicans maintain a majority in the Senate, and they maintain a healthy plura, uh, a number of seats in the House because they win almost everything else. And that means that if you're inside of a metropolitan area, you almost certainly live in a Democratic represented area. And if you live outside of it, you are almost certain to live in a Republican area. Uh, the political analyst Dave Wasserman divides it into the Whole Foods and the Cracker Barrel divide. <laughs> that if you live near Whole Foods, you probably, even if it's been a historically Republican area, now represent living a Democrat. And if you live in a place with a cracker barrel, you almost certainly mean that you're in a Republican. This is going on in part because we are now divided on values. And they are divided on values in a way that makes it particularly dangerous for the American Republic. That in, I've written about this for an English publication called Unheard, U-N-H-E-R-D. But when you look at the founding, they're very concerned with how, with a lot of different things. But one thing they're very concerned about is they don't want America to become like Europe uh, with respect to religious war. So they make a decision that the federal government is not going to deal with religion, uh, which in those days is really the question of values, you know, translating, uh, putting salvation and how one should live one's life into the political sphere. That's not going to be what the federal government deals with. But what we're really arguing about now, what brought the passions to the fore on both sides of the Kavanaugh decision, is that because we have now federalized questions of values into constitutional law, and we have centered those not in the political branches where we have checks and balances that encourage log rolling, but in the judicial branch where you have the nature of the judicial practice is to form stark um, cases that demand uh, a, a yes or no, a binary response. Either you have a right or you do not have a right. What that now means is that things that the modern equivalent of the religious wars, the questions of how to live in which there can be little or no mediation between them, are now political. And, and that means is that people who are, live in the cities tend to be less attached to traditional religious mores, tend to be less in tune with ways of life and cultures of rural or small town areas that find its expression in things like widespread gun ownership. 
and the rural areas feel under threat. There's a question in, this is happening throughout the Western world, but it's particularly acute here, in part because we remain more religious than most of the rest of the world. So uh, we have a religious populist element to our politics that adds to the economic and cultural populist element that is roiling European politics. And so there's a question I've taken to thinking is very important that Germans asked in exit polls for their Bavarian state elections. Roughly translated from the German, the question was, I feel sorry or I am regretful that uh, uh, everyday traditional German culture seems to be less and less important. And you, they ranked the people who voted for the parties. Uh, and the people who uh, voted for the blue collar populist party, 100% of them said yes, they agree with that statement. I've been reading polls for 45 years. I've never seen a 100% answer before. I've seen 98% answers, believe it or not, but I've never seen a 100% answer. And then each party goes down exactly as you'd predict, that two thirds of the center right parties agree with that, and 60% of the slightly more centrist party, and 50% of the business free market party, all the way down to the Greens, only 20%. So what you saw in Germany is that if you were conservative in the rural areas and you felt this way, you tended to leave the center-right party for one of these other parties. If you were a moderate urbanite, the German version of the moderate suburbanite, you left for the Greens. The same hollowing out is happening in Germany as happening as here. And what I think is that if you ask that question, and um, I'm planning to ask that question uh, on a poll that I actually helped direct uh, sometime this year, and said instead, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm fearful or I'm concerned that American traditional values are, growing, are, are weakening on a daily basis. I would bet you would have a very strong correlation between both fervent Trump support and fervent Trump opposition and among the people who swore are in the process of switching parties. The moderate Republicans in the suburbs are more like the moderate uh, conservatives who switched to the Greens in Germany and the rural, small, depressed town, blue collar types, the Tigers, uh, are more like the AfD voters or the CSU voters who are shifting right in Germany. Uh, so what that means going forward is we should expect 2020 to be incredibly bitter. Binary val heights over values almost never end well unless people can find a way to stop fighting over it. This is a binary fight over values is what the Civil War was about. Is slavery right or is slavery wrong? People tried to find a middle way between that but without addressing, you could not split the apple on the question of the morality of slavery. And consequently, the South and the North could not live together. And we could only resolve this by suppressing and crushing one side of it. If the question of today's moral disputes are framed as rights with judicial implications rather than prudential choices with political implications, we will see continued political fighting of an intensity that we have not seen in quite a long time. Each party has unstable coalitions, and I'd like to move to that and then end my speech with some meditations upon that question. Democrats uh, are, of course, exultant over their newfound majority, uh, but the wiser of them recognize that they now have a, uh, a coalition balancing question. Not only do they have to balance uh, all of the coalitions, uh, people within their coalition whom they have been used to fighting with, the progressives versus the non-progressives and different factions trying to gain precedence or attention within the democratic coalition, but now their majority depends on satisfying people who have never thought of themselves as Democrats and have no dog in these hunts. Will they vote in democratic primaries? Who will they choose? Will they tilt it in one direction or another? Do you have to pay attention to them, or can you keep them with the pablum of a virtual no agenda, which is what was offered? When your main campaign theme is pre-existing conditions, you don't have a serious agenda. Serious issue, it's not an agenda. It's a bridge issue. When you run for president, you actually have to have a comprehensive agenda. How do you deal with these people? That will be one of the major questions of the Democratic Party because the alternative to dealing with these people is trying to win back some of the tigers. And that poses another set of coalition management questions because there's a reason they left the Democratic Party and the reason they rejected Democratic representatives and Democratic challengers throughout the Midwest when they had an opportunity. 
the differences between the National Democratic Coalition, all parts of it, and these voters are strong. But that doesn't mean that coalition management is going to be easy. The Democratic Party, if one looks at exit polls from their primaries in 2016, is a party that tilts decidedly to the left, that in 2004, exit polls showed majorities of Democrats who voted in presidential primaries, said they were moderate or somewhat conservative. In 2016, the majorities in virtually every state said they were very liberal or liberal. But these new voters are, are people who call themselves moderates. If they vote, they're basically potential reinforcements for the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party. And what does that do to a party where Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who hasn't even been sworn into office, is already saying that they should primary the longstanding Democratic representatives who are of liberal background because they are not liberal enough? How is she going to take to the Romney voters who actually gave them the House majority? How will other progressives take? That is an unknown question. But the Republicans don't have an easy question, too. That's because they remain at an official level and at a partisan level very uncomfortable with the Tigers upon whom their Senate majority and presidential hopes rest. You can look no farther than that than questions of trade. That if one of the two things that Donald Trump targeted these voters with early on is their longstanding concerns over immigration and trade. And if one removes them directly and sees what they have in common, what they have in common is that people who are feeling pressured are unwilling to continue to have um, unregulated competition with foreigners. That foreign trade is the flip side of immigration, that they compete with foreigners for their labor through trade, and they compete with foreigners for labor through immigration. And they would like both restricted so that they can return to a more stable and a more steady economic future. The Republican Party is nearly unanimous for all of its divisions in its opposition to the president's trade policies. They don't like the tariffs. They don't like the renegotiations of the deals. And if they could, and many people within the White House are trying surreptitiously to do this, um, they would prefer that this all be dropped. But how do you address the Tigers if you aren't comfortable in talking about the economic dislocation that they have felt for quite some time? How do you address them if your concern is to win back the moderates in the suburbs who are all of your best friends and where many of your donors live, but they can't elect a president and they can't elect a majority in the Senate because six extra congressional seats in suburban California doesn't do anything to support either of those goals. The president can probably manage that coalition. The party has a very hard time managing that coalition and how they conduct themselves in Congress to either support or hinder the president could do quite a bit in sundering or uniting that coalition going into 2016. Now, from a Republican perspective, it would be ideal if the president could keep this coalition and woo back the moderates, woo back the, woo back the rhinos. That's their path. If the Democrats figured out how to move from 48 to 53 percent by attracting these voters, the Republicans' move from 45 to 52 percent is to get them back and add them to their existing coalition. The problem with the Republicans is that the Republicans in the national leadership position seem to know how to bring the moderates back but not keep the Tigers, and the President seems to know how to keep the Tigers and not bring the moderates back. That means that the President, unless he changes and moderates in some way, his tone and his style, picks his fights more carefully and actually pays more attention not just to his core supporters and to his converts, but to the people who have left the pews and have stopped giving to the church collection. Uh, he is going to depend on his reelection on the same forces that propelled him in the first election. We often like to say about 2016 that it was the only election where everybody didn't like everybody. But that's actually not true. 78% per, uh, of Americans uh, liked one of the two candidates. It just so happened that if you liked one, you didn't like the other. 41% uh, liked Clinton on election day, and 98 or 99% of the people who liked Clinton said they were voting for Clinton. Trump had 37% favorability, about the same, 98, 99%. Two people said they liked both of them, and everyone I've ever said that to says, who are these people? I want to meet them. <laughs> but 18% said they did not like either. And Trump is president because he won that group 47 to 30. They broke late in the campaign. They were disproportionately male, college-educated, Republican-leaning people. 
they held their nose and voted for Trump because they preferred the devil that they thought the policies were better in Trump to the devil that they thought the policies were not better in Hillary Clinton. In effect, when the Clinton campaign waged a never Trump campaign, uh, Trump saw them and raised them by waging a never Hillary campaign and never Hillary beat never Trump. In 2018, the reluctant Trump voter voted Democrat. People focus on independent college educated women, but the fact is that independent college educated men also voted for the Democrats. And they have moved more since 2014 than the women. Both have moved towards the Democrats, but men have moved more towards the Democrats. A, Republican, a Democratic strategy that thinks you only got women and didn't get men risks repeating the Hillary Clinton problem in 2020. A Republican strategy that thinks that uh, you can get the men back uh, without dealing their concerns essentially requires the Democrats to make a monumental mistake in nominating somebody who can be characterized about whom a never fill in your bogey person campaign would trump, trump a never Trump campaign. So where we're at is at a very parlous moment in American politics. We are a country divided geographically. We are a country divided emotionally. We are a country divided on values. And we are a country that continues to be engaged in a 24-7, 365 political cycle that exacerbates rather than cools those tensions. I don't expect 2020 to be fun. And, I'm not, and if, if the parties don't manage their coalitions properly, regardless of the outcome, it will be inconclusive and simply kick this can down the road for yet another bite at the apple in the ensuing four years. Yeah, I saw a lot of people raising their hands. <laughs> run through a number of these questions here if I could. And um, the first I'm going to ask you has to do with party identity. That was an explosive question. The first, yeah. the first question has to do with party identification. Um, do the Tigers consider themselves Republicans or Trump supporters? And by the same token, do the Rhinos consider themselves Democrats or Trump opponents? Um, that is a great question. Um, I think what's happening is they're beginning, but I'm, I'm hoping to get some data back on that in about three weeks, where I'll be able to actually use a longitudinal data set to see how these people's party identifications have shifted over six years. What I think right now is that they're both in motion, that we know that some people who have said that they are um, uh, were Obama Trump voters now think of themselves as Republicans, and we know that others now think of them in the other direction now think of themselves as Democrats. But I don't know the magnitude, but I should know by January. Okay. okay. Uh, another question has to do with the perils facing the Democrats in deciding how to respond. And the question here is if Democrats can succeed by moving to the center to keep their rhino base, or not their base, obviously, their, their rhino support. Right. Is it, on the other hand, and maybe this plays into the Republican strategy in 2020, is the Republican hope that Democrats, in fact, will be unable to do this because the National Party will be forced too far to the left? Most Republicans both hope and expect for the latter. They th look at the Democratic Party and they think it cannot control itself, it cannot contain itself, that, um, I, I, and that what I experienced uh, just yesterday is something uh, uh, two days ago, I'm so busy. I'm fly literally flying everywhere. <laughs> it was two days ago. I was before a group of uh, predominantly liberals and talked about the, exactly what I talked about. And the response from the audience was, "Don't moderate." <laughs> well, congratulations. As I said to them, congratulations. You know, you might win that way, but if you don't, you're actually maximizing the chance of a Trump re-election because you actually have to consider who these people are, uh, and maybe you're banking that this time never Trump will be never, uh, ne never Gillibrand, uh, but maybe not. Uh, one of the questions I have here has to do with the relatively little attention you paid to the gender gap in your comments, and they yeah. wanted you to sort of expand a little bit because so much of the pre-election commentary was that this was the Achilles heel of the Republican Party, and it would be the principal, or one of the principal reasons they would face 
real trouble in 2016. Yeah, I mean, it, so the gender gap um, has two components. One is that um, because of a host of issues uh, or a host of reasons, the Democratic Party has both been more female oriented and become more female oriented over time. If you go back to 2004, about 52% about of general election voters are women, uh, mainly because they outlive people like you and me. Um, but um, Democrats in 2004 in the primaries were 54% women. Uh, in 2016, they were 58 to 60% women. And if you look at the gender break of people who declare they are Democrats on exit polls, they are 62% women. That is a substantial part of the gender gap, is the self-identification into Democrats. The Republicans can do nothing about that, because to try and stop that means to stop being who they are. The a second gender gap is among independents. Uh, that independent, there is no gender gap. If you are a woman and you are a Republican, there is no gender gap. That's true if you look at the last three exit polls. Republican women, if you identified as a Republican and you were a woman, you did not switch your vote. You may have stopped saying you were a Republican and moved into the independent camp, but if you stayed in the Republican camp, you, there was no gender gap among Republican identifiers uh, at all. Uh, there has been a gender gap among uh, independents for quite some time, that there are people who tend to vote Democratic, but not le they lean Democratic, but they don't vote Democratic. Um, that gap did not grow over the last four years. That's what I was trying to get the point as. Yes, women moved to the Democratic Party, but men did too, and at slightly greater rates. So if what you want to do is focus on half of that equation, what, the reason Hillary Clinton lost is because uh, she did move independent women to vote for her. She carried independent women. She lost independent men. And as I mentioned, the data suggests that reluctant Trump voters, who can be found everywhere, but they tended to be independent Republican-leaning men. This time, those people came over so that it was both men and women with a gender gap, but you needed both. So to focus only on women is actually a grave misservice to the group of the electorate who you brought along to turn a plurality into a majority. So uh, yes, it happened, but it was far from the only story. And if the Democratic Party wants to focus on that and continue to target on that, they once again play into Trump's hands. Two, related to that is a question I have here. Given what you just said about the Republicans and their political, the, the, the political issues they have, although you, you sliced it there, I mean, you demonstrated the complexity of it, with women, on the other hand, uh, Republicans have had some success in electing women to Congress. What do you make of that? Well, look, just because there's a gap doesn't mean there aren't tens of millions of women who vote Republican. Um, that you've got um, Republican women who um, you know, are quite uh, capable of raising money and raising support from men. Marcia, they can be very conservative, like Marsha Blackburn, or they can be somewhat less conservative, like a Susan Collins or a Deb Fisher. Um, because there is a, the Democratic Party now is at the point where when you have a supermajority of people who are women, and an important subpart of that group are women who define themselves politically by their gender, you will find primary results tilt in that direction. And that's what, in fact, you saw is that people throughout the primaries were saying, wow, look at all these women beating men. This is unprecedented. Well, it's only unprecedented if you compare it to past results. When you actually look at the electorate, the question isn't why did it happen now, but it's why didn't it happen before. Whereas a Republican primary, it tends to be balanced between men and women. Uh, it's slightly tilted towards the men, but you don't have that large, um, uh, you don't have that large gap. So if a Republican woman can get through, a Republican woman will do just fine in a Republican area. But um, uh, there will always be fewer of them because the Democratic Party is a female party that tends to want to elect women. I would be rather shocked if the de unless there are seven women who are all dividing up the women's vote and two men who. Are, are the serious candidates, I'd be shocked if the Democrats do not put up a woman just because of the, mi the demographic makeup of their party. Top of the ticket. You I'm mean sorry? The, the, Top of the, the ticket. Nom nominate. Yeah. Right, nominate. It, it, given what we're seeing, if you, have a, if you have a male versus female top of uh, bottom two, uh, 
uh, you know, final two. I don't see how, unless the man is an African American and the woman is a white, because then you have African American loyalties that come in contradictory to the female loyalties, you know, more like the Obama Clinton race. Uh, but if you have you know two white candidates, a white man and a white woman, I'll, I'll go to predictit.org right now and put money on the white woman, no matter what the poll says. Okay. Uh, one question has to do with what the Republicans might have hoped their legislative program, such as it was before the election, would have done for them. How would you measure the significance uh, in particular, this is the question, of the tax cut and for the wealthier voters in this primary? The tax this, cut this was always a political DOA, but the Republican Party blinded itself to that. Why was it a political DOA? One, there was no voter demand for it. Voters tend to react when people talk about issues they care about. They don't want to, it's not that they don't want a tax cut, it's more that they don't mind a tax cut. But it's not a motivating issue. Unlike the 1980s, when people really did demand lower taxes, and you could see it in, rep in ballot initiatives where they were cutting their own taxes when they had the opportunity, there was no demand for people to cut their taxes. Uh, on the other hand, what you could see very early on is that people who left the Republican Party over Trump to vote all the way for Clinton had animosity to the Republican Party throughout the process. And the Republican Party in Congress chose never to address that. There was this big elephant in the room, and they acted as if the elephant were Harvey's elephant, invisible to everybody. Um, reference to a 1947 Jimmy Stewart movie. And, it, and I believe it was a rabbit. <laughs> yes, that's right, it was a rabbit. Harvey was a rabbit, thank you. <laughs> oh, a, a, miss, a, a fumbled reference to a 1947 Jimmy Stewart movie. You know, it's just, they were so enamored of the supply side theory and the mechanical view of how people vote. You know, feed their bellies, uh, get the economy going, they'll forget everything else. No, all of the evidence throughout the election cycle suggested that this was an unbelievable delusion. And so consequently, the Republicans never were able to separate themselves from Trump. One of the things that was really noticeable in the polls and also in the election results is that with very few exceptions, Republican incumbents or challengers did exactly as well within a couple of points as the Trump approval rating in their district. So you could be a representative who'd been in your area for 14 years, but you weren't going to win a race by having people say, I know you don't hate, you hate Trump, uh, but you like Peter Roscoe. Um, he ran a few points ahead of Trump in his district, but not much. It, people were nationalized this race on both sides to an unbelievable degree, and the Republican Party refused to see that, and consequently, they reaped uh, what they sow. Let, let, let me ask you, uh, just to riff on that for a second, a question of my own, just mm -hmm. in response to your suggestion that the Republicans were sort of blind to the DOA character of their program. Well, willfully blind. They weren't unwillfully blind. They chose to put blinders over. And is that, is that because, would this be, one, one suggestion might be, that Republicans in the Congress were just simply more responsive to demands for interest groups for whom these tax cuts were really intensely important than they were to the larger uh, popular I, I, response. People on the left tend to ascribe Republican devotion to tax cuts to a thinly veiled bribery. Uh, that you know, it's the interest groups are basically trolling through the Republican uh, community with dollar bills. Actually, it's a matter of faith for most of them. They have been taught that people want smaller government, they respond to tax cuts, they vote on the basis of the economy, and so consequently, they won't, s it's less a matter of of responding to special interest groups, and more like uh, if somebody came up to you in the middle of your faith community and suggested something wasn't true about one of your tenets. Um, it, it's incredibly difficult to break through an article of faith, and all of the evidence of the elections could not break through that faith. They remained determined to the end that a rising economy and, good, uh, and, and the tax cut would be what would allow them to win back these voters, even though there was no concrete evidence outside of their own uh, bubbles that that was the case. Uh, and I'll be very interested to see whether or not they change their mind now that they've had their hats handed to them, or whether or not 
their argument is going to be more of the same, but maybe a little more like George W. Bush's kinder, gentler uh, conservatism and a little less like Grover Norquist. I remain to be convinced that they will actually rethink um, that maybe they're just out of touch with these voters and what they want. Take a look at Kansas. In Kansas, we had a governor, Sam Brownback, who pushed through a state version of a supply side tax cut. You know, cutting the margin, raising sales consumption taxes, lowering taxes on the top brackets, and eliminating taxes entirely for small privately held corporations. This was supposed to produce a massive windfall of economic growth and a massive windfall to the budget. It didn't. And after four years of budgetary problems, the Kansas rhinos uh, in 2015 and 2016 and 2017 waged primary battles against conservative backers, won their primary battles, and, oh, and repealed the governor's tax cut. It has nothing to do with Trump and had everything to do with what do these voters want? Do they prefer services or do they prefer lower taxes? They raise taxes on themselves because they'd rather have services that they value than tax cuts that they didn't. And a Republican Party who went through all of that and still thought that they were going to appeal to these voters, literally the identical voters in Kansas 3 who tossed out Kevin Yoder, by doing exactly what Sam Brownback did and thinking that they were going to have a different opinion this time, they were kidding themselves. Okay. Another question we have here is... <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I can get a little vehement. No, no, no. It's, it, it's, it's a, a, a critically important point. Another question here is, what are the effects of, uh, I'll reframe the question slightly, disillusionment or about the Trump economic program the ability to bring back manufacturing jobs and whatever, what effect could that have? And in particular, had, say, General Motors made the announcement it did before the Ohio, before the election this November, would that have had an effect on the outcome in Ohio? I don't think it would have because Trump's immediate reaction was, how dare you do that? You know, you punch me in the face, I'll punch you in the gut. And that's what, the, that's what those voters voted for. Mm -hmm. They would almost expect that GM wouldn't have changed its spots. What would have hurt them is if Donald Trump had changed his spots. Um, if there is somebody who has benefited over the last two years from the expansion, it is the tiger, that they tend to be likelier to be facing a tighter labor market, a little more likely to be working, a little more likely to have a raise that they'll notice, as opposed to an upper, in, you know, if you're in an income, you know, if you're making $150,000 a year and you're used to 6% raises, going from 6% to 7% is a rounding error. Uh, for these other people, it might have been something that they dimly felt and attributed to Trump. But as long as Trump is fighting for them and they're not seeing a reversal, I think they will continue to support a Trump-led Republican Party as long as the party doesn't then try to distance himself from Trump on that issue. Um, but if what you see is that Trump's fighting for them and things are going backwards consistently across the board, uh, then I think you might see a rethink. But the very simple question of... If GM had done this on October 20th, would that have changed people's votes? No, because Trump would have been fighting for them, and that's exactly why they elected him. Okay. All right, so the last question before we, um, we, we move to the break in the next panel, if, if I could, one last question. I'm going to read this one. It's a, um, one I would not do well to paraphrase. How does one go about explaining why these demographic shifts and trends in voting occurred? Once you've noted that Tigers voted a certain way, how do you discern the reasons or values that drove some, but most of all voters in a given demographic, to change how they voted this year? That is a very complex, that's a great question. It's a very complex question. We're trying to do that through a project that I direct at the Voter Study Group. That's a group funded by the Democracy Fund, a group of pollsters and analysts moving from the progressive left to the libertarian right. Emily Eakins, who will be on your panel later, uh, has written some very interesting studies using our data. He's part of this group. Um, it's difficult. Um, I think the fairest thing to say is that among any large group, there are always multiple reasons. There are people who move for one reason or people who move for another reason, and it's very difficult to tease out uh, that. Uh, but um, the only way you can do it is by having uh, in-depth, uh, comprehensive, um, um, polling analysis then combined with sophisticated data analysis to try and tease out causation. You'll never know for sure, but you can point much more with a little more certainty in general directions. Like we know from other work that we've done that immigration was a key motivator. Um, 
what aspect of immigration was a key motivator. That's harder, and it's harder, you know, it's also then starts getting up with your own self-identity, is that, you know, is, is, is operation, there, there are people who believe that racial prejudice is so ingrained that any rational reason that's advanced for an opposition to immigration is a smokescreen. And there are people who are so resistant to that that they will read any sort of racial animus that's expressed as a false negative. Um, and it's very difficult, once you get into that, for people to put aside some of their own, even for analyst partisan blinders. But um, I think what's pretty clear is that there was combination of um, economic, social, and cultural dislocation. And it's one of the reasons why I like this Bavarian exit poll question. Because when you got 100, the AfD in Germany is the closest equivalent they have to the Trump blue collar voter. People who used to be across the political spectrum, but you know it here in this group that doesn't like immigration and has a left-right balance. They're friendly, they want to be friendlier to Russia. They don't like immigrations. They're particularly hostile to Islamic immigration. And their economics is a hodgepodge of left and right. Sounds like Donald Trump. Uh, so when 100% of them agree with this question, maybe this is a question we should ask about America. Hey, thanks a lot for the opportunity.